Uh, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the, the fifth British Canoeing Community of Practice webinar. Uh, I'm here. My name is Gareth Wilson. Uh, I'm a, a slalom coach down in Lee Valley. I'm, I'm here filling big shoes from Craig Morris, who uh, who's previously hosted uh, the webinars, which I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed watching and engaging with. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to being uh, being able to host host the webinar today. Uh, we've got a, a really interesting topic, and we've got an awesome panel to to discuss it with. Um, before before we get into that, I uh, just like to go through a little bit of housekeeping um, to make sure that today runs really really smoothly. Um, first thing is uh, those of you who are joining us live today, please may you uh, mute your microphones and uh, switch off your your webcams. Uh, just to make sure we don't accidentally cut across any of the panel whilst they're, they're discussing the topic. Um, secondly, I, I may have already said this, um, but just to let everyone know and make you aware, we are recording the webinar today. Uh, the purpose for that is to be able to share it uh, with the wider community if they've not been able to log on for, for the webinar this afternoon. Uh, if you have any concerns, please drop a message in the, in the chat box on the right-hand side, uh, and Sid will be able to take that up with you. Um, which brings me to my, my third point of housekeeping. If you look on the top right-hand side of your screen, you'll see a little message uh, message box. It's got a one next to it at the moment. If you click on that, uh, a little drop-down menu will come down and uh, you'll be able to interact with the panel, ask some questions, uh, share some observations. You know, It's our ambition for this to be a really, really interactive session. Uh, we want you to get an, as much out of it as, as the panel will, uh, and please just fire it across. Uh, anything that, that springs to mind. Um, if we don't manage to field your question uh, during the discussion, uh, please hang about at the end uh, once we've finished, share your details with us, and, and one, of, uh, one of the panel or myself will get back to you um, and, and answer it so we, do not, uh, we don't leave you hanging. Um, so uh, moving forward, I'm, I'm, I'm really uh, grateful to be able to be here and, and operate in this kind of space. I've, I've, I've had bizarre opportunities with not being on the bank myself to, to get into little spaces that I wouldn't usually, you know, watching uh, SCA webinars with John Schofield discussing uh, coach athlete relationships with, with Tim Brabant and the confidence he got from that. I watched a webinar that Ivan Lawler did and he talked quite profoundly about goal setting and the importance of athletes owning their goal and, and, and the power that that gives to them. Uh, and, you know, I'm hoping that this this session today will really contribute to all those really interesting topics that are being covered within paddle sport, but within within the wider sport whilst we're in this this lockdown period. Um, which brings me on to today's session. Um, what we what we're aiming to do today is we're going to explore optimal environments for talent development, uh, but we're really going to try and hone in on um, that from a perspective of uh, developing a skillful learner. Uh, with the, the help of the panel today, we're, we're going to explore this idea, we're going to uh, examine it from a little bit of a theoretical perspective, uh, and then we've got a host of coaches, a panel of coaches, who will bring a bit of colour, bring that to life, give examples from their environment. And then uh, what we'd really like to be able to do by the end of the session today is um, to leave you guys with some key takeaways um, that you can take into your own environment, critique, Think about how you might be able to adapt and evolve into, into your own practice if you think it's, it's useful for yourself or indeed uh, how you might be able to develop uh, your own skillful learners in, in, in a club, at the Regatta Lake or on the riverbank, wherever. Um, so I'm really grateful to be able to explore this, this topic with, with a really awesome panel today. They have uh, they're vastly experienced and they come with varied backgrounds from paddle sport and academia. So without further ado, let me introduce you to the panel. Um, maybe if I could just start with Gareth Bryant. He's a man I've known for, for many years. I, I wrecked one of your C2s about 20 years ago, and I assume that because <laughs> you're on the court, court with us, that's water under the bridge now. Um, it, it is. A long time ago. Long time ago. <laughs> So, tell us a bit about yourself, uh, what, uh, where you're from and what you do. Cheers, Gareth. So, thanks. Uh, well, I'm, I'm based in Llandysil in West Wales. Um, 
I've been based here, well, I was part of the club when it first started back in 1984. So I was one of the first members and managed to stick with it, really. And um, I've been one of the coaches uh, with the club for the past 30 years, really. Um, and I do a, a variety of coaching from pool sessions, intro to sort of paddling, just getting on the water and, and you know, first, first experience of paddle sport, um, all the way through to um, slalom coaching then where I coach um, the top end, some of the prem paddlers, all the way down to division four paddlers. So like a proper a, a club structure, really, just a bit of everything, really. Um, I enjoy recreational boating, a um, bit of sea kayaking, um, but slalom is my main sort of background anyway. Great. Thanks, Gareth. It's great to have you here. Um, Emily, just moving to you, introduce yourself uh, and tell us what you do. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm Emily. I originally from uh, have a background with kayaking, um, specifically kayaking um, based at, at Elmbridge as, as an athlete um, and have since uh, moved into to coaching where I uh, based at Nottingham coaching uh, the canoe, specifically canoe athletes ranging about 13 to, to 18 years old along the pathway from basically beginner level to uh, to up to um, sort of around the junior level. Great, thanks for that, Emily. Like, really good to, to hear. We've already got like good breadth of breadth of experience and breadth of pathway from our first two two panel members. Uh, coming to you, Ian, could you just fill us in a little bit about yourself, uh, what you do? I can attend to, yes. Sounds like a bit of a dating agency getting all your details. Um, yeah, my, my background, uh, I'm from the world of slalom. Um, being an athlete many years ago, um, went to two Olympic Games and then transitioned over into coaching. I've been as a coach up the pathway, so started at junior level, up to senior level, and then back down the other side. I'm currently head of our ENTS program, which is our, our junior program. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, keen, keen to be here. Appreciate the opportunity to get involved. Thank you. Cheers, Ian. Yeah, uh, and introducing our final final guest, um, Phil. Please, please tell us a bit about yourself. Oh, I feel like Scylla now. <laughs> Sorry, Phil. Please take it away. Uh, so, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Phil Carney. I'm a lecturer in motor skill acquisition at the University of Limerick, which is on the west coast of Ireland. Um, I'm also a course director there for the Masters in Applied Sports Coaching. Um, and along with Ed Collin, uh, Ollie Logan, Alan Dunton, I'm involved in an organization called Movement and Skill Acquisition Ireland, which is uh, trying to raise the profile of skill acquisition within, within Ireland in particular. Um, I have a uh, no experience in, in paddle sport whatsoever. My, my sporting background is very much in track and field. Um, that's where I was a, a very average athlete. Uh, transitioned into to doing a lot of research in that area now and also doing a little bit of coaching in track and field as well. Uh, most recently swapping around, so, so coaching some of the youngest members of the club, um, but really enjoying getting a perspective across the entire development pathway because that's where my, my research interest is primarily the development of, of youth athletes. Um, and I'm, I'm you know really, really interested to be here. I'm really interested in this forum, in, in hearing from the, the other coaches to hear what you currently do, uh, because I think that's where, where some of the richest learning is when we have conversations from science to practice, but also practice informing science and seeing you know, where they fit together uh, what what different area groups are, are focusing on? So I'm really really keen to engage today. No, that's that's lovely, Phil. I um, and I really appreciate it, and I learned a lot, challenged my thinking a lot when we spoke on Monday. And and it's welcome to all the panel. Looking forward to getting into this um, today, Phil. Maybe we could we could stick with you um, just to open the open the topic uh, today, and you know, um, just really open up the discussion about why why it's imp an important topic uh, in terms of optimal environments um, and why it's important to you? Yeah, sure. Um, so within skill acquisition, traditionally, an awful lot of the research is focused on the things that the coach does. So, you know, how does a coach use feedback? How does a coach deliver instruction? How does a coach design a practice uh, environment? How does a coach use questioning? So all of these things are the traditional focus within skill acquisition. But the athlete does the learning. What the athlete does has an enormous impact 
on how successful uh, the learning env environment is. And when we look at research, yes, from sport, but also from music, from academia, um, across a whole range of different domains, we see that expert performers are also very skillful learners. They approach their learning in a different way. And um, this, I guess, first came on my radar when, when I was about 23 and decided to shift over to multi-events from, from focusing on a single event in track and field. Suddenly found myself having to learn how to pole vault, having to learn how to, to throw discus and pick up a lot of skills really quickly. And that's where it started to get me really interested in these ideas around, well, I've only got so much time. How can, how can you accelerate your learning? Um, and from there, it's, I've just you know, engaged in, in several projects where we've looked at how can we explicitly set out to develop more skillful learners with the idea that a more skillful learner will progress to become a more skillful performer because you've given them the tools to accelerate their development to become a more skillful performer. And so um, that's the bit that I guess I'm, I'm really interested in exploring with the panel today and hearing what this looks like from a canoe perspective. You know, so if, if you think about athletes at your club, athletes that you're working with, um, are there athletes that you can think of, anonymously of course, but are there athletes that you can think of who, who are just really good at learning, who, are, who maximize their use of practice, practice time, who get the most learning out of their sessions? And these might not be the best performers, but they're the individuals that you think, you know, I, I wish every athlete could approach practice and engage in practice behave like this and think like this because if they could you know they would just accelerate their development so quickly so i guess maybe the, the first question to throw out to the panel is does that sound that idea that some people are more skillful learners they have a set of tools a way of behaving a way of thinking that accelerates their learning does that sound familiar to you in a canoeing context can you describe what skillful lo learners look like in the context of of canoeing Gareth, I can I can see you nodding like well, as, as, as I Phil's was, talking. Yeah, it's just I'm just visualizing some of the athletes that we work with, sort of historically and ones that we've got um, on you know training at the moment. Well, not at the moment, but um, on our books at the moment as well. And it's just really um, athletes really that are sort of they're, they're interested really in what they're learning about and um, and they're sort of they, they they like to make the most out of each session and motivated and just sort of just really enthusiastic about about what they're doing and and it sort of it, it sort of makes them a sort of a motivator for the group as well then really so it's um so it's just it's just um you know i was visualizing some of the some of the athletes really and uh and they're just a joy to work with i suppose really because they they they're sort of they're keen enthusiastic and bringing a professional sort of approach to the, to the session really that's my sort of little input there i think Oh, guys, you're on. You're on mute. <laughs> oh, classic. Um, <laughs> no, thanks. I, I'm listening to that, and I'm really resonating with me. Some of the things that you picked out there. What I can see, Emily, you're nodding as well. Is, have you got anything that, that you can you can build on from Gareth, Gareth's observations? Yeah, sort of similar. You've got those people that sort of come to mind, um, and I think especially uh in the early stages it's it's as simple stuff as sort of showing up on time um and uh bring in the right sort of equipment and that's i think i can think about it with people uh, in the earlier stages because the stuff that they're, they're not just used to doing it is stuff that they do need to think about and so those guys that are more attentive you don't have to constantly remind them whether or not that's that's a bad thing, I don't know. But um, you know, they do show up, show up with the equipment um, at the right time, and they they engage with you straight away. So there's that sort of readiness to listen, um, which is uh, obviously something I think you have to to earn as well um, as the coach. But for them to sort of engage with that straight away and and not take do you know take more attention on you than their peers is quite uh, an important skill I think. Yeah, nice. Yeah. I think um, what, you, what you're saying there it really um, 
makes me think of something I heard Bob Bowman talk about, Michael Phelps' coach. And he talked about being on time and Michael Phelps would cycle as a kid to training and arrive at 4 a.m. without fail. And, and I think <laughs> we all know kind of what Phelps went on to go and do. So that's an interesting observation. Raz, anything to add? Um, not really. I think, you know, all those people who are involved in coaching will recognize the sort of cliche behaviors that we're looking for. Um, and I was asking myself, you know, do those behaviors represent somebody who is better at learning or is quicker at learning? And I'm uh, deliberating in my head. But I think, you know, the reason that we are recognizing those behaviors are because uh, those are the behaviors that have been displayed by those people who, who naturally filter to the top. And therefore, the, the, the argument would be, yes, they are significant in, in enhancing performance and accelerating learning. Um, and so, yes, and I do, I do see it. You know, those guys who arrive at the session, um, I had a little pres presentation from Adam Burgess, for those that are not in the slalom scene. He's a uh, representative for the Games in 2021 now in C1, and he talked very much about um, arriving. And he was not meaning that you pull up in your car, but that you actually are there psychologically and ready to go. Um, and I think for me, even working at that junior level, um, I'm appreciating that some of the guys there are a step ahead of their peers in the fact that they come with an agenda in mind straight away. And therefore, the investment uh, that is made by myself or them has something to hang on. So that would be, uh, yeah, a quick no. shell. Brill, no, I really hear what you're saying. And just to pull a couple of things out to maybe throw back to Phil, I heard a couple of things which was about um, uh, uh, their joy to coach, their readiness to listen. And Rasbro talked about the cliches. Um, I'm thinking, Phil, um, you know, that, you know, are we biased kind of thinking that is what, what good learners look like? Or is that, or is that something else? You know, I'm thinking what, what Maverick, I don't know if it's the right word, but what Maverick, people might look like within a club or within a session um, doesn't mean that they're bad learners. They might just do it differently, right? Yeah, absolutely. As you say, so, so there's, there's so many points that came out there and, and that's a real advantage of having this recorded so you can kind of listen back and think over some of those. So, um, uh, and, and I'm just going to react to a couple before I answer your question. So, you know, one of them is a, a joy to work with. You know, so uh, a really important point, I think, for coaches, if you want long-term engagement in your your in what you're doing, you want to find as much joy in there as possible. So you want to be actively taking steps to increase the amount of joy in your work environment. Um, so you know, thinking about if these people are a joy to work with, well, how do I ensure that more athletes I'm dealing with are like this, so that it becomes a better working environment? Um, I'm going to react to the, the the arriving term that Ian used. So that's a fantastic term. You know, psychologically ready to go. And some of the descriptions that I've said, it's about interested, motivated, uh, showing up on time, kit ready, everything's ready to go. So yeah, that's that's really nice about what happens before the session, that giving you some of these, these characteristics. Um, I'm, I'm very keen to throw this back to the panel and just to ask, well, what about actually during sessions? So can you think about maybe after runs or just before they do a run or when they're they're processing a run that they've done? What what else would I see? What what were they what would they ask about or talk about? Would you see them engaging in any other behaviors? Uh, how would they they break up the task that they're engaged in? So what else would I see that might help me distinguish between a really skillful learner? And somebody who hasn't got that skill set and i think that's a really important question to dive into because there is this risk that we're just saying well this is this is a set of, of conforming to some expectations about how we think people should act politely in our group which might not necessarily be reflective of of skillful learning so you know i've had a conversation with coaches in the past where they've said you know i'm looking for somebody who's standing up at the front of the group making eye contact so, well, if you've got a relatively young athlete and a relatively shy athlete within a peer group, you know, they might be not adhering to that behavior for some very different reasons. So, you know, we've got to be very careful here that we understand what are those key skills that are associated with skillful learning? What do they look like? What are the behaviors, I say the thought processes that we can try and see some signs of and, and be very careful that we're not just going to, to the, the cliche, 
because and, and again, Maverick's a great word. We don't want to, to shut out Mavericks. So uh, I think that maybe slightly parks the, the, the conforming question. If we could dig in a little bit more into what would I see if I'm standing beside you on the bank and you were to say, right, watch this. This is the kind of thing that a really skillful learner does. This is the kind of thing that I would like other, you know, if you're talking to a young uh, athlete beside you and say, this is how, you know, a really skillful learner acts. This is who you should be paying attention to. What else would I see apart from some of those early things showing up, equipment and all that stuff? Emily, can I can I come to you? I've, I've seen that there's a couple of questions coming in and we will field them. Um, but just Emily, um, maybe just filling in on it. Filling in that answer with with Phil there. Yeah, yeah. I had I had a good think about about some of this stuff um, because yeah, straight away the people that come to mind are ones pretty obvious. Um, but there are other athletes where you do um, their commitment to learning, and I think that comes in, although whether they've got maybe a lack of confidence or their the way their character is doesn't. Uh, you know, that doesn't mean they're as outgoing. What I do see is the willingness to challenge themselves. So they, it doesn't mean they're answering all the questions. Um, it doesn't mean that they're wanting to show off in front of the group, but they might be afraid. They might like the idea of some content within the session, but they're not afraid to give it a go. And that's not without a little bit of reluctance either, but they are then able to reflect either with me or with themselves and come back at a later date and see how they developed within a session, which, to, which is just as powerful. It's just a different way. Um, and actually, in some ways, I think that's, it's really nice that they are comfortable to stay true to what they feel comfortable with doing whilst having the opportunity to, to learn and challenge themselves. Yeah, thanks for that, Emily. Um, Raz, have you got anything to to expand on in terms of what what you might see within the within the session? Um, yeah, again, my my reflections. I think those those individuals who we might say are at the front of the bus uh, are those individuals who, as I said to start with, they come they come with an objective in mind. They know what the session objectives are, um, and in terms of their conduct um then i guess from a practical perspective uh, they are observing their peers not in terms of um whether they're judging are they doing it better or worse than myself but using them as a source of information and reference in regards to their personal learning you know what can i take from what i've just observed what what what, what seemed to work well can i apply that um so that would that would be an obvious thing for me um i guess they they tend to engage more with me on the riverbank um i'm recognizing that that might be down to personality traits a little bit and my experience would suggest that um you know i, I do have athletes who i i would suggest are good learners but maybe a little bit more reserved in coming forward um but you know assuming that we just take that side of it out at the moment then uh I think that they are the coaches provoking um, discussion and observation all the time. What's interesting for me is when an athlete provokes the discussion and the observation. And uh, again, I would say that, that is a, a trait of somebody who I would recognize that is a little bit above and beyond maybe some of the others. They're, they are happy recipients but the, the the athlete who is proactive and is really engaging in what the session's about and trying to develop their competencies is somebody who starts to ask the questions you know what do you think what do you think about this rasbo i recognize that on this instance this happened you know, do you think that's good that's bad and, and possibly even engaging with their with their peers a little bit and provoking conversation that way uh, that's really interesting i was thinking Without, without diving in myself, I was thinking about in terms of what you're saying there, the, the athlete kind of provoking this, the discussion, but also kind of um, leading the problem solving themselves to a degree. Um, 
Get Gareth in West Wales. Uh, any yeah. anything different that you've observed there, or I think the only thing is it's not really it's not just one type of skillful learner. You've got sort of you've got a variety of different types. You've got the ones where you can hardly get a word in with them because they're just off doing doing doing. They just they just they just want to be out there paddling and just and playing and and just sort of learning for themselves almost. And then you've got the other ones then um, who who would like a lot more sort of feedback and thinking a lot more and um, and then analysing, reviewing, and then going back and trying stuff. So I think it's, it's very hard to sort of sit on the riverbank and go, oh, look, there's one there. That's a very sort of thoughtful learner, you know, and uh, and that's that, that's that sort of trait there. I think there's just so so many different types, I think, and uh, and it's just trying to sort of, pick out that sort of the skillfulness in in both in in, in, his, in all the different paddlers that's really interesting you've, you've made me think there it's like i wonder um what they'd learn regardless of whether there was a coach there anyway regardless mm. of whether there was there was somebody else paddling with them you know if you were to just sit back and watch what they did you know how they're engaging themselves in the task that they set um and how the tasks even that they set themselves might look different to other to other people and I think that's where, you know, when I talked about the cliches to start with, Gareth, then I think that's where that came from, is that we just, yeah. we have to be a little bit careful that because these individuals aren't demonstrating what we see as the, as the appropriate behaviours, does that mean that they aren't learning and they aren't learning effectively? Um, and, yeah. you know, you, uh, you, your, your comment, Gareth in Wales, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, did, did make me reflect a little bit um, on, the, on some of the experiences I have. And I had, have, have had athletes, as you highlighted, who may be a little bit more distant, but you can definitely see there are cognitions going on and there's reflection going on. Um, yeah. Well, can I, can I, just... I perhaps just into... Oh, sorry, Emily, go for it. Just a really quick one, um, just be, with, within that, actually one of the challenges I sometimes find is making sure uh, that athletes are aware that I don't expect them to be like a certain type of person who is, a, who could be the person that's always answering questions, giving feedback, you know, shooting by example. I, I am conscious as well of not sort of saying because because I'm rewarding that sort of feedback that I want everyone to do the same as well. Like the way they give feedback, I sort of hold them to their own standard. I think that can be quite tricky sometimes. Mm. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. I was just going to interject, Phil. I'm, I, I don't want to break up the, the, the conversation too much, but I think we can segue into one of the questions that we have here from Greg, which relates to the uh, conformity really relates to to mavericks i was just wondering if anyone on the panel uh, can actually point to somebody that they've worked with who didn't conform you know but went on to go and do great things you know i'm, I'm hearing lots of things from the panel about how they may be dealing with that but has anybody got examples maybe just one coach you might be able to offer i can put forward Ryan and Wesley, and again for those that who who are unfamiliar with the slalom world, Ryan it was one of the three contenders for the C1 place, um, along with Dave Florence and Adam Burgess. Um, he did 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 suffer a, a series of injuries, which some might suggest tempered his performance and may have been our Olympic bolt. But yeah, Gareth, uh, sorry, uh, Ryan when he was. Uh, what would have been early 20s, was working alongside me, and he definitely didn't align to the type of behaviours that I would expect to see. And it actually uh, it actually came to a head where he was removed from the programme for six months because of, uh, well, one particular instance, um, but, but a number of, of, of sort of repeated type behaviours. What, what I would say there, just as a caveat, was that... Um, Ryan was a very talented athlete. Um, he had a, a great technical feel for the boat and still does. And anybody uh, I'm aware of, Neil, who's on the call, who, who coached him as well, would recognise would recognise the talent he had. Um, I guess what we need to ensure is that we don't blur the fact that he was he was successful, and that success was was rooted in his in his technical capabilities. And I guess the question I would beg was, could he have been even better if those behaviours 
um, were more in line with what we would expect. The, the, the quick conclusion to the story was he was removed from the program for six months. He came back and whether because of the removal from the program or just an opportunity to reflect on his own his own life and where it was going, he, he did make a significant turnaround. And I guess that maybe does answer the question. Those behaviours did start to comply. And now he is one of our top and, and one of the world's top boats. Great. Thanks, Raz. Uh, Greg, hope that answers your question. Please, please, we can we can try and elaborate further if, if you want to dig deeper. Phil, maybe uh, I cut you off a bit earlier, but maybe you can you can kick 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 start the the road that you wanted us to go down and, and to focus on. Yeah, no, this is this is exactly it. So you know, I asked that that question as a as a broad open question, um, and what's really nice is the just the, the richness of examples that came from the different coaches, saying that you know there's, there's actually there's lots of different things that we see, and it's also not that everybody's acting the same way. It's that you know everybody is is maybe reflecting. Everybody's involved in analytic processes, but they're analyzing in, in different ways. Sometimes it's more analyzing with the coach. Sometimes the people are paying more attention to peers. Sometimes it's more kind of a quiet back and getting involved in discussion and are not getting involved in much discussion. Um, so there's, there's different ways in which people can act. And it doesn't mean that, that one of these techniques is better than the other. That's not the case at all. The research suggests that there are many ways in which you can engage uh, in more skillful learning, many skills, many tools that you can use, many approaches that you can take to, to reflection. Um, for instance, it's not that we're trying to get everybody to the same way. We're trying to get every learner to engage in some more complicated, some more um, sophisticated analysis of their, their progress and, uh, and what they're doing when they practice. Um, and so and I think there's some, some really nice examples came out there uh, in terms of what people were uh, we're explaining. So it doesn't matter, you know, what people do, as long as they are engaged in some form of sophisticated uh, layering on their on their practice. Um, just to pick up on, on kind of Ian's point, we might come back to that in a while. You know, a removal from the program. Um, it's obviously not something that you want to have to do in order to to kickstart a player's development but that again is very consistent what we see in the research there's a lot of times that we see people who um who were not particularly engaged who were not practicing in a very sophisticated way not particularly engaged with the program uh, and sometimes it can be quite a severe kick that's required in order to to get them to engage um i'm wondering actually because uh, again the key thing here is we want everybody to to engage in skillful learning. Um, I was trying to think, uh, Emily made a great point about, you know, you want to make it very clear to athletes that this is highly individual. And that's really important and a really key bit that we want to keep. But you've also just explained, this is how you can and accelerate your learning. These are the kind of things you can do to accelerate your learning. So I'd be really interested to hear, you know, do your athletes know that? Do you tell your athletes that? How do you tell your athletes that? How do you layer in teaching them to be more skillful learners alongside teaching them to be more skillful paddlers? What is it that you do that you find to be particularly effective that other coaches listening in might be able to, to mimic? Uh, Gareth, would you, would you care to try and uh, answer Phil's question with, with a few examples about how you've done that? Yeah, I think it's um, it's through sort of challenging and reviewing the sessions a lot. Um, and uh, my, my daughter and my son both paddle as well. And uh, it's just trying to work out what a skillful learner is, isn't it? And breaking down what they do in a specific way. It just so happened I was speaking to my daughter last night and I said, and I just said, oh, just give me three of your top um, top paddlers that you like to train with. And she named three paddlers that she enjoys training with. And in my head, while we've been talking about skillful learners, those three would have come out as the top three you know, in my head as well. So it's strange that she's picked out the people she likes to train with that are those those three paddlers that I that I thought would be very skillful learners as well. Um, and it, it is hard because people do learn in different ways. Um, but it, I think it's just really reviewing each session talking about how the session went and trying to get the, the, the athlete to try and um, start thinking about what's working well for them i think if that makes any sense 
Yeah, yeah, really, <laughs> loads of sense. It's a really great question to, to ask her, you know, and I, I wonder like what it was that she saw in those three paddlers, which she, which she identified with, you know, yes. as, uh, that drew her attention to them um, and what she might then try and adapt into her own kind of learning practice. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I tried to dig a little bit deeper then as well. And it was, it's pretty much people that they enjoy to paddle with. And it's, and she said one of the things as well is because they are always challenging, you know, they're always coming up with their own sort of, uh, if you if there's a course, they're always trying to challenge it, make it harder, you know, putting different, different moves. And it's, um, and it just becomes a fun session as well. You know, it's just enjoyable. So so yeah, I did, I did sort of dig a little bit deeper, and I know the paddlers really well that she's that she's referring to, and and they just seem to be the paddlers that are there at the end of the session, just playing and having fun as well, because it's the love of the sport, isn't it? You know, and uh, and I think if if she's you know feeding off that energy that they're giving, then um, then that that's why they become a skillful learner because they're enjoying what they're doing. Yeah, that 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 challenge element. Uh, that you kind of talked about, you know, I see, I see in people that I've worked with and just wondering, Raz, like to build on Phil's question, like how much of that needs to be kind of articulated as about why it's beneficial and why people will buy into kind of adapt, uh, adopting that kind of idea for their own, their own development. Any ideas around that? Um, uh, yeah, I, I think, you I mean, as a, as a program, we either directly um, or even covertly are, are, are trying to develop um, ways to behave and to conduct yourself. And I guess, you know, you've made me think, you know, does some, does some of that come across in, a, in, a, in, in too much of a formal manner? We, we, use, a, we use a framework, uh, we've got the High Performing People Framework, which is a, a tool that Changing Minds developed, again, for those people who are not familiar, um, just sort of distilling the research into, you know, what do high performing people do that makes them high performing, whatever domain they're in? Um, and we use that as a bit of a backdrop to try and foster these behaviors that we're looking for. And, and some of that is done a bit more formally in the classrooms and, and, and talking about those behaviors. Um, but I would say there is this continual drip feed going on from the coaches um, and, and through the athletes. I mean, one, th one thing that, that we introduced a couple of years ago is this, you've heard me use the term already, front of the bus behaviors. Um, and that is it has, has sort of become a bit of a catchphrase for the talent program within British Canoeing, um, which really is representing those behaviours. Uh, just to just to under, understand the background a little bit, it, it was a, a bit a bit of a metaphor for me. Where you know when we get on the bus, you see those people who go at the back of the bus who have been a bit of a pain in the backside and maybe distracting the drive from where he's going. Those who sit in the middle who are happy to sit there quietly and just go on the journey, and then you go those that come to the front, and those who come to the front. Uh, are those individuals who are interested in where we're going and what direction we're going on and why are we taking this route and not that route? Um, and I, in a way, I think that that really just um, captures uh, the image of maybe what those athletes are about. We want people at the front of the bus who, who, who are asking those questions, are taking control of their own development and driving the program for themselves and ideally making the bus driver redundant. I think that that is an aspiration. Um, and I think that, you know, all, those sort of messages are drip fed in um, through the coaches, through observing others' behavior um, and, and maybe even some posters up on the wall and various other things that are continually reminding them that this, these are the ways that if you want to progress, these are the ways you should be thinking about doing it. Phil, Phil you're nodding. I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering whether that's answered your question enough or... You need yeah, to explore no, further. Uh, really liking that, and again, you know, the, the combination of things. So one, there's, there's conversations, you know, fundamentally, um, and it, these can be sometimes formally taught, sometimes informally drip feeding little bits. You talked about role modelling, so you know, again, I'm, I'm always interested for coaches, for clubs, you know, for for programs. So how do you set it up? You deliberately say, right, this is how within the the, the next little activity or the next environment we've got, this is how we're going to deliberately 
set it up to increase the opportunities or increase the chances that the younger athletes, the less experienced athletes, will absorb some of these good behaviors, good practice behaviors, good way of acting from the, the those people who are ahead of them. So, you know, what, what exactly do we do? Well, we do A, B, C. And sometimes that could be we chuck a poster up on the wall, as you said, Ian. Sometimes it can be, you know, we, we arrange time to have that conversation. Uh, sometimes it can be we set up a challenging activity and we know it's going to challenge them. And then once they get over that challenge, once they manage it, we ask, so what did you do? What was it? How, what were you thinking? What were you trying out? Was it something to do with imagery? Was it how you broke the task down into parts? Was it how you managed your attentional focus? You know, what was it that you did that made it easier for you to learn that? Or I see you've got it. That's it. That worked. What was it? What did you do? Just make that that learning more explicit, not just about what they've learned, but also about how they've learned it. And that's really important because it gets back to, again, one of the things Emily was talking about. This isn't about copying somebody else. And it's the same way that you would apply with technique. You know, you're not one athlete for you isn't going to copy another athlete's technique exactly, but they might use that to help them explore to find what the best approach for them is. So we talk about skillful learning again, whether it's park practice, slowing it down, imagery, uh, different attentional focus elements. These are all tools that we can use, but not everybody uses all the tools all the time. It's about learners who've got a big toolbox and they can go, right, here's the tools that I'm going to try to help me accelerate my learning in this instance. Um, and it's about encouraging or finding ways to encourage people to, to really explore that, uh, to explore how they learn so that they, they become uh, more skillful learners, you know, bigger toolbox to come uh, to use. Nice, thanks. Yeah, no, I think, um, you know, just to, to summarise a couple of the, uh, the the bits that we've heard so far, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of time. I've um, picked up a couple of comments um, uh, from what we've heard. Uh, Tom, Tom, you asked about um, successful learners and curious learners. Uh, that what, do, we, do we think, do we agree that it's because they are curious, they become more successful, they want to understand more about the sport, kind of resonated a little bit with... Um, uh, my notes don't actually say, but I think it was Emily that said about the enthusiasm that's brought. I think Dan Goddard, if he is on the call, would, would nod his head to, to you, Tom. Something that really resonates about understanding the sport and wanting to, to, to understand technique to get better, for example, or understand something that they go, oh, there he is. Dan's agreeing. Thank you. Good to see you out there. Um, just to add in on top, that, just to say, so, you know, again, if you think curious is really important, so what is it that you are doing to build curiosity? You know, that, that's if, if you think it's important, you should be building it. How are you building it? What is it that you do? Um, that Again, being able to, to relay that can be really helpful. That's great, because what you're saying, that one of the things you, you said earlier, Phil, was that it's, it's the athlete that does the learning. And, you know, it's kind of like pushing, a, you know, it's giving them the responsibility of it, pushing making us conscious as coaches to go, well, how are we taking responsibility to make sure we're putting the right things in place to make sure that they are at the center of that learning, if that makes sense. Can I, can I ask a question in the risk of taking this off the rails? And you can pull me back Go in. For Go for yeah. it, Raz. Is that, I, I, I'm recognizing that a common discussion, certainly in amongst the coaches uh, within the British Canoeing Programme, and I'm sure outside, is how much do you steer their learning and how much do you sort of cast cast them free to learn? Um, and, you know, through that conversation, it was, uh, I was being provoked a little bit to think about, you know, sometimes I guess I would probably call myself a bit more prescriptive than some. Uh, I come I come to the session with a with a with a fairly clear obje objective of what we're trying to do and why we're trying to do it, and this is the gate sequence that is going to try and provoke that learning, uh, and then I I'd like to think I facilitate that learning process. Uh, I guess I maybe with with the lenses on that we just talked about, I, I maybe wonder whether in in being so prescriptive or being more prescriptive. Am I am I dampening the opportunity for them to learn and to be become effective learners? And might I structure? I can't think quite how I do it off the top of my head, but might I structure the session differently 
in order to try and enhance the amount of learning that comes out of that opportunity. Can I jump in on that? For yeah, sure. Thanks. I was hoping we'd jump in. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I can check the gas any day. <laughs> So for me, I guess the, the, the key outcome here is what do the learners do? How do they approach the situation? Uh, what do they do when you're not there? So by being very prescriptive, by taking them through, look, here's a, here's a really good strategic approach to take, um, you might be giving them a really good template to follow. Now, if you're then remove yourself and say, right, now you tackle this next challenge, this next situation, or you come along and it's a fresh day and now let's see what you do. Can they cope? Do they apply the things that you've applied? Do, do they engage in a sophisticated way with the task? Do they manage themselves, their motivation, their learning, their time on task? You talked earlier about, do they set themselves a specific session objective and adhere to that and stick to that? Do they find the part that they need to work on? So do you give yourself, you know, I would say your, your system works if You've made yourself redundant and your athletes can take that and they can apply it without you there pushing them. So do you give them an opportunity and you say, right, today, I'm just going to watch how you learn. I'm just going to see what you do. And if they start doing the things that you'd like them to do, your way is working because they're taking that and they're independently doing it. Whereas if they don't, that maybe suggests you're a little bit too prescriptive and they're a little bit too dependent upon you. So I test it. <clears throat> Okay, thank you. Raz, I was going to just come in. I've you know, worked with you before, seen what, what you've done, and some of the things that I've, I really like, I know that you've done, is you've, you've had your guys set up your session, but their sessions, um, you know, and, and put the ownership on them to make them think about, well, you know, if that was the objective, how are you going to, like, set up the session to kind of achieve it? You know, and you've, you've, almost, you've almost taken the scaffolding away for them to kind of build their own. You know, if that make if, if if you follow my yeah, analogy, I think, I think when I was working further up the pathway, that was easier to do. I think by sure. you know by the time we've got past our junior years, or in my opinion and experience, by the time we've got past our junior years, I'd like to feel that their you know their understanding, their education, their insight into what we're about and what we're trying to achieve and how to go about doing it is much more informed. And consequently, you know, a scenario like that can be undertaken. I think there are some of the older juniors, more more experienced juniors, who I, I believe could do that. But I would be um, reluctant to do that on a regular basis um, with some of the younger athletes without feeling as though I was compromising their development and that the, the agenda um, was so, so broad and uh, the... the, the you know, in terms of drawing, uh, I think he used, um, what, um, Phil talked about an analysis and things and, and, and I guess drawing conclusions from that analysis. Um, and I think that sometimes the agenda becomes so broad that you might end up getting off at the end of the session saying, well, what actually did we conclude from that? Yeah. Yeah. No, thanks, Raz. Um, I'd love to pick this up with you again after. <laughs> Um, because I think it's a really we we we're risking going down a bit of a rabbit hole, um, and we've got twelve minutes left because it's 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 a really interesting. I think there's lots of lots of things that kind of influence it. I I often think about like um, what influence, what pressures are we under as coaches? Saying you know, are we prioritizing learning or are we trying to prioritize performance, which might look different at different stages. Um, and you might do things differently if you weren't focusing on getting somebody into a team or getting somebody onto a, a program or whatever. And I think that, that that's a philosophical question that we have to, we have to debate and, and rectify almost elsewhere. Um, Phil, I, I'm conscious we've got a couple of questions from, from, the, from, our, from the community. I was just thinking yeah. about maybe fielding those uh, a bit and then Maybe we could come to you in about five minutes to, to kind of start concluding, if that's all right. Um, so, Emily, I, I've got a question from uh, Sid um, to ask, uh, how, how did the coaches balance the need to encourage a problem-solving approach against, um, against success-feeding motivation? Um, 
what does that mean to you? Um, yeah, that's, it probably is a challenge I, I have, to be fair. Um, especially, uh, I think sometimes I'm conscious of sort of doing the wrong sort of damage. So I guess I come from a um, uh, it's mo mainly motivational and trying to look on the positive side. So it's the aspect of trying that I want to re reward. Um, and then in terms of then challenging, it's 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 more than okay. If I challenge, is there still that support system around it? So I want you to go and do this. I want you to do it on your own and use each other as a team. But if you need to check in, you can have discussions with me or other other people um, so that you're still trying to reach everybody's needs who aren't, you know, the, the standard norm. But I don't know if that really aren't, answers it. I think it's something I'm still, I still work through. Um, but I definitely um, probably more on the side of not giving them enough challenge all the time or when it when they need it or when there is time for it because I'm a little bit too cautious around not you know you get so far with building someone up and getting them motivated you don't you almost don't want that to fall back even though sometimes that's an important step to make. Mm. I saw I, I listened to an interesting podcast the other day relating a bit to that in terms of you know, you've got to you've got to balance like your problem solving your your um your ability to fail comfortably and how close you might do that relative to a competition whereas you might actually do something which you can repeat you gain confidence from 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 something like that rather than always hitting them with challenge unless you really know your athlete and that's what they they're, they're craving just before no, yeah. thanks for that yeah. um gareth I, I was just wondering if i could come to you um luke's got an interesting question which is about understanding how a participant learns best and have you got any experience of how you've you've le used learning styles to be able to uh, understand that further yeah i think i think they all learn differently to be honest with you. you you might get lucky and you'll get a bunch of paddlers who actually all learn through um th th through one method you know whether it's going out and trying or whether it's a an awful lot of um theory side of stuff first but um but i think that most of the time you've got different paddlers in your group who learn different in different ways really so it's just a case of trying to sort of make your session um available to each of those athletes really so making sure that that you've got enough um paddling time for the ones that just want to get out there and paddle and learn through their mistakes and 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 um and learning through sort of playing with the with the water um and you and then enough of the time then for the for the other ones then who actually need to need it explained a little bit more to them um before they get out before they even go out and do it quite nice though because then what you've usually got then is someone out there who's actually giving it a go while you're actually chatting to one of the other paddlers then so um but i think you've just got to be aware that the that um all all of the paddlers are, are gonna they're gonna learn in, in so many different ways that you've just got to keep adapting your coaching style then to try and meet the needs of each one of those paddlers yeah nice um gareth thanks for that I, luke i hope that that starts to answer your question and i'm pleased i can see you've got like three more after that um mm -hmm. Please hang on the line if you if you want to kind kind of uh, address them any further. Um, Phil, I, I just lo love to be able to come back to you. Uh, aware that we've got five minutes left, um, just wondering if we can we can try and like start to wrap this up uh, in terms of like key takeaways and practical messages from from your perspective, from what you've heard today and your own knowledge um, uh, for our community to go away and, and start thinking about and, and discussing further. Uh, yeah, so I, again, I think the, the usefulness of, of exercises like this is, is uh, the thinking that you do afterwards. So what they've prompted you to think about in terms of your own practice and what you're doing in your own practice. Um, I think this, this idea about skillful learning is a really important one. You know, if you, if you use an analogy of studying, which most people are fairly familiar with, you know, if you read and reread a textbook, that's that's going to get some information in it, but it's not a very sophisticated way of, of studying. You're not going to learn a huge amount from that. Um, there are many more sophisticated ways that you could study. 
It could be about testing. It could be about elaboration. And I'd, I'd encourage coaches to sit down and think, so, so what does skillful learning, skillful practice look like in my context for the age group I'm working with, for the interest that I'm working with? Um, because uh, I can't remember who said it earlier on. It was one of the chat questions, I think. You know, some of the individuals are more interested in the social aspect. So, well, if they're interested in the social aspect, then actually we want to downplay this high performance, elite, high quality practice element because that might not be very important for the group that you're working with. When they are ready to engage in higher quality practice and invest more in practice, are you ready to give them the skills to do that more effectively, to teach them how to be to be more skillful learners? Um, and then I think... The, the second bit would be to, to think about what skillful learning, as I said, what does skillful learning look like in canoeing um, and how do you develop it? What is it you currently do on a daily basis to develop learners who are better at learning? And it's the small things that you do on an everyday basis. And, you know, from, from Gareth from Wales's small conversations and just asking the questions after certain events to Ian's talking about, you know, just the broader bits about encouraging role modeling and, and sticking up some posters and making some explicit lessons. Um, there's lots of ideas have come out of this that you could take and you could say, yeah, I can see how I can apply that into my practice and go experiment with it. And to, again, to emphasize what, what Emily was saying about the very individual nature of this. So you're encouraging people to explore and develop. So they will end up, everybody will end up learning, practicing in a, in a slightly different way but have you encouraged them to explore how they practice so that they have a better knowledge and understanding of how they can practice more skillfully going forward? So I think those are some of the, the key takeaways for me, as well as the fact that canoe coaching seems to be in a very good place. Oh, thanks very much, Phil. Um, yeah, it really, it's really, uh, really great to hear that. Um, I'm sure that people are, are watching, listening, and they're going, oh, cool. Well, I'm, I'm, we're doing that in our club. We're, we're doing that in our centre. Uh, and maybe there's a little bit more understanding about the why it's been done like that. And, and I guess like my encouragement and something that I always try and do myself is, is to be brave with introducing new things, but understand why you're introducing new things and you know, you bringing your athletes along with it as to why it is important. You know, again, Emily made that great point earlier about see, see who, the, look at the individual in front of you we heard in a previous webinar, you know, it's like coach the person in front of you, not the person that you want to coach kind of thing. Um, yeah, I think that's a really important point to, to kind of almost wrap up on. Um, we, we are, we are at the, out of time. We are uh, just in terms of like the, the final wrap up. I've just got a few messages to, to be able to, to put out. Um, Sid is, is going to share a bit of a link. Yeah, we're we're really keen to to get feedback on these uh, on these webinars. Um, whether you think they're good, whether you think they're bad, uh, you know, we we've got thick skin, but we we really want to improve. We really want these things to be able to work for our wider community. Um, you know, please give us the feedback, whether it's uh, an email to me, an email to Sid, to Craig, or through this Survey Monkey, which you can find in the chat. Um, we can we can only improve it if if we hear what you think might need improving um and there was one other point that i was going to make which was um we'll stop recording in a second and if anybody wants to stay on the line uh to um discuss anything a little bit further to field some questions to, to the group and they just don't want to do it whilst we're, we're on record please do so um and I uh, and we'll we'll all be there to to help out and and have some further discussions. Maybe we'll we'll take the uh, the mute and the cameras off so we can see each other face to face. Um, but other than that, I'd just like to say thank you very much for your engagement uh, in the webinar today. Huge thank you to our panel for giving up their time, sharing their expertise and their knowledge. Uh, and uh, until I see you next time, uh, we will let you know what the what the next topic will be. Uh, but everyone stay safe and look forward to seeing you on a riverbank soon. Take care, everyone.